J.W. Friday's journey from San Antonio, Texas to Portland, Oregon, embodies the spirit of resilience, creativity, and community leadership. His arrival in Portland as a grade school student marked the beginning of a lifelong commitment to music, community service, and empowerment. I'm the J, the dash, the D-U-B. I'm the originator. Yay, that's me. Um, J.W. Friday. Well, from San Antonio to Portland, Irvington Grade School, and I'd venture to say that it probably started at Irvington, had a great mother that had us involved because she was involved. She showed up when she wanted to, and she corrected us right where we messed up at. So I was disciplined from an early age, but I was also introduced to different things. She kept us busy. Today's kids jump on video games and all of that, but we were at Bible study and choir rehearsal, and, and she volunteered us to sing uh, various songs, and we learned along the way, and then opportunity to um, be introduced to music and uh, something a little bit greater than um, just a pair of uh, tambourines and uh, sticks that you clack together. We had a great uh, music teacher at Irvington. Uh, her name was Dorothy Shear. And not only did she teach us uh, how to sing uh, in plays that she wrote for, for all the grades, uh, she introduced us to music as well. My first attempt, I wanted to be a drummer. I think everybody wanted to be a drummer. And I missed that audition. And it was during a time, it's really kind of a funny story. It was during a time when we used to play flag football. And I always wanted to play flag football, but they would never pick me. But on this day, they picked me. And Miss Shear said, if you want to play the drums, you need to come in at this specific time, which was during our recess time. And they just had threw me the ball three or four times. So I stayed out on the field uh, catching footballs and missed my drum audition. So by the time we got in there, all the drums were gone. And she introduced us to the cello, because that's all that was left, which was kind of big and bulky. But uh, in learning how to, to bow it, it sounded great. But things started happening when we got introduced to pizzicato, which is plucking the strings. I like that more than bowing. And I kind of got a little bored with uh, the cello because of its weight and decided I would try something a little bit different. And I was, always, I was fascinated with the trombone as well. Something about that slide trombone. I think we saw something out of New Orleans, and or maybe we caught a, a glimpse of Grambling or, or Southern or something like that. And I was just noting how they were marching with that trombone. And I wanted to play the trombone. But once again, just as I was late for the drums, I ended up with the cello and wanted to go to the trombone. All the trombones were checked out, and I got introduced to the baritone, and which is a trombone, a little bent up, but it had... It had valves, you know, so that's kind of how we found ourselves there. But I missed the piano introduction, which is probably the first part of it. Uh, Mom wanted, matter of fact, my dad always wanted to have a piano in the house. And when he passed away, Mom made certain that we got a piano, a Story and Clark, a spinet piano. And that's where it really started and learning how to chord and, and uh, attempt to read music under Esther Cox Todd. She was a um, older white lady that was a paraplegic, uh, confined to a wheelchair, but she wrote music for the New York Philharmonic. And that's where it all started. It was a lot of fun. I remember a song called Whirling Dervish. And it was just, it was just, uh, it was, a, it was a, a keyboard exercise and learning how to appropriately strike the keys, left hand, right hand, over and over, left hand, right hand whirling dervish and I got tired of the whirling dervish and I changed it up a little bit and uh, she said to me that's not what's on the page and I said to her but that's how I feel it and she says you're attempting to read by ear if you start reading by ear you will not be any good for anything and as time went on of course the ear took over and I never heard the part about not being good at anything because we started listening to songs and trying to play them so uh, we're thankful for Esther Cox Todd, but she was wrong. The ear opened us up to a lot of different things, but we're thankful for the experience with the cello, which brought us into the realm of strings. We're thankful for the uh, baritone, 
which brought us into the realm of brass, which is trumpet, trombone, and tubas. And of course, we're glad that we didn't become a drummer because in that we learned about how important the cadence is and the, and the drum line, which is one of my favorite movies. I cry all the time when I watch that because the energy is the HBCU, where I should have ended up. And had I made it to Grambling like I wanted to, I would have been a Q dog, nothing less. So that's who J.W. Friday is. I've been exposed to a lot of great things and great people, and they took time with me. And uh, in that, I consider myself to be a sponge, you know, where I can come in and I'll use a term from uh, Michael Chappie Grice. I learned what the gleaning field is. If you're around people who are smart, guess what you'll attempt to be? If you're around people who are lazy, you'll be asleep all the time. So I try to hang around people that are reaching for things, that have a moment to talk to me when I ask a question. And once I get the question answered, it's, the question is, how will I apply it? And hopefully I've applied it to uh, a greater work. At Grand High School, we found ourselves playing in a band um, with some neighborhood characters, uh, a couple of them from Jeff, well, one from Jeff, Ricky Brain. He's a demo crat, or should I say a demo rat? He was our guitar player. Our bass player was my brother-in-law, Harvey McDaniels. He played a, a five-string hagstrom, and unlike the rest that played it with their thumbs, he played it with the tips of his fingers. Nobody in Portland played like that then. He was so far ahead of, of all the Nathaniel Phillips from Pleasure. He was so far ahead of him. Uh, Phil Wilborn from the Gangsters and the Uniques. George Pickett, another bass player. He was so far ahead of all of them because of his playing style. And then our drummer was Greg Henderson. He went to Benson High School, as well as James Thomas, who is the son of historic wrestler Hall of Famer Shag Thomas. And he was our vocalist and trumpet player when I allowed him to use my trumpet. <laughs> so, uh, like I say, in the, in the marching band, also had a band, and that's high school. We had too much fun. And they had like great drum majors like John Moore and Lincoln Brown and Jefferson, um, Gary Ladd. Uh, this is uh, their community icons because everybody used to come to the Rose Festival Parade just to see the marching bands. So glad to be in the band and I've had the opportunity to, or should I say the entrustment, to uh, be a drum major. You know, so I really understand Dr. King's message, the drum major instinct. Because everybody wants to lead, but nobody wants to follow. So that's one for the day's uh, community as well. Kind of the close of high school, I, I had a, uh, we had 56 Chevys, uh, Ricky and James and all of us. And uh, I acquired a 57 Chevy that had a 327 in it, had a 375 high pro, 456 in the rear end, a Muncie four speed, and, and I, I got into cars. And I was into speed and stuff like that. My mother kept saying, boy, you love cars too much. You're going to steal a car. But I knew then, as I know now, first of all, I don't weigh enough to go to jail. And me and the jailhouse have, have nothing in common. I don't even want to visit people there. So uh, that wasn't my forte. But like I said, I went to college for automotive. And I got a scar right here on this hand, if you zoomed in on it. And what this scar says, they pay people to do this. I dropped a transmission on my hand. And I thought I broke it. But in that moment, I realized there's stuff I can do and I can only take it so far. And there are people that are more in depth and have more knowledge than me. And I would do it as best I could. Then I'd take it to the people that could finish it. So I learned then that automotive was not my forte. And then, like I said, the Cavaliers were going pretty well then. Uh, we played everywhere. And I want to give a, um, a th big thank you to Shag Thomas because of his international popularity. And he had a club on the corner of 15th and Killingsworth called Shag's Arena for a long time. We played there. And also a shout out to uh, the late Mr. Galati from uh, Grand High School. He was our activities director and he liked me. And so he plugged us in and we played every high school dance, uh, not just in our, our uh, jurisdiction, but everywhere. Oregon City, Vancouver all behind Mr. Galati, and he was a great guy. We just lost him a few years back, and uh, he touched a lot of people because if you were trying to do something, Mr. Galati was the guy that would help you to get there and then 
try to keep you there because he would touch base to see how you're doing. So, yeah, a lot of fun after high school, in high school, after high school. And then playing in the clubs, we, Cavaliers, we traveled with the intruders back in the day, Cowboys to Girls. And that was our professional introduction. And I always tell people that's when we got rent because we understood how professionals act. They don't always act the right way. You see the stories, the backstories, and the temptations and all that stuff. Yeah, all that was happening. And guess what? We were 15, 16 years old and onward and upward. So we hung around the professionals. Uh, we gleaned the positive and we experienced the negative as well. So we grew up kind of fast. You know, we, we look at the princes and those that have been on stage forever and we just live and learn. And I also shout out to, um, to the Cotton Club. <laughs> I have to do that. I think back, I was telling this story the other night. Uh, the Cavaliers played at the Cotton Club one night. It said one night only, the Cotton Club. And I think we were, I know we were in our teens, so we shouldn't have been in there because you need to be 21. But because we were musicians, I was allowed to sit on the organ bench with Billy Larkin. And Billy Larkin was a phenomenal Hammond player, uh, B3 Hammond. And I had a problem with this left hand. I could do right hand chords, but the left hand didn't want to run the bass right. And then, of course, you got to coordinate this foot to run the bass pedals. And, and Billy took some time with us and taught us how to do it. We had two phenomenal keyboard players that I grew up with from grade school through high school and into the professional ranks. And that was the Sanders brothers, uh, Jimmy and John Sanders. And they could play keyboards from from Jump Street. If I could kind of flip the script back a little bit to uh playing in the Battle of the Bands when we were in high school uh, at the Memorial Coliseum. And it was a great night. And why, what made it such a great night, uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes were in town, and it cost 99 cents to see them on a rotating stage. And I never forget I had a dollar, and I thought I was going to go back the next night. And my mother said, where are you going? I said, I'm going back to see Diana Ross. She said, uh, you're not going out tonight. I said, but Mama, I need to see her. She said, she don't want to see you. I said, yes, she does. Mom, she winked at me. She said, son, she winks at everybody. <laughs> so I didn't get to go. But on the next year during the Battle of the Bands, uh, we opened uh, for Sly and the Family Stone. And that was kind of crazy. And what made it so cool, I was talking about the keyboard that we had. I had a Lowry spinet organ, and we had brought it down, and I went to lift it on stage. And, and Sly and them had just put the album out, I Want to Take You Higher. And I went to get it. He looked at me and said, oh, man, leave that down there. You can play my Hammond. And according to Ricky and James and Greg and Harvey, I never played so well. <laughs> but I was motivated by Sly and the gang. So, yeah, you hang with people that can play you. You strive to do the same thing. I had a, I had a television experience um, on Rambling Rod. I had taken some kids down to be a part of the show. And we've always watched it on television. And uh, television is not what you think it is. That was the mind. We got down there and I saw the set. And then he had a little boat that he would walk behind and float in on, if you will, with the kids. And I'm looking at the studio just like we're here now looking up at the lights and things going, man, this is a fake. And then I walked into the control room and that's where everything began to to uh, be stimulated, if you will. This gentleman was uh, the director was calling the shots and the switchers and and and, and all the monitors just kind of had me going. And I'm watching what was going on outside of the window. And he was making everything look so, so awesome. And we were it was a fake environment. Everything we were looking at was fake. And that was blowing my mind. So I sat back and I kept thinking about it. I said, I like this. And I started talking to one of the cameramen. I said, so this is what you do. He said every day. I said, do you work hard? He said, as soon as I finish this, I'm locking this camera down. He locked it down. He said, now let's go have a cup of coffee. And I said, is that what you do? He said, yeah, we shoot a show, then we take a break. Then we shoot another show and we take a break. And I was like, no, this is what I want to do. So um, I went to school uh, for television, uh, Portland Community College. And uh, the broadcasting program had a prerequisite and you had to take radio. And I wasn't thinking about radio then. Uh, Michael Vance, we had a uh, shout out to Roy J. Uh, shout out to all of the, of the voices. Uh, first voice, Eager Beaver. 
uh, who is a front runner, and then uh, Jimmy Bang Bang Walker and his knockout cleanser. You could brush your teeth with it and clean your toilet. He was quite a character on the air. And then there was uh, Cleve Allen, a gentleman. He was confined to a wheelchair, but you would never know it. And I mean, these guys were the best in jazz and blues and and all of that. And then it, it, it comes right up to my teacher, my mentor, uh, the late, great George Page, the Master Blaster. And the Master Blaster, he played the all of the music. He had great relationships with most of the people that he played at Muddy Waters. Any of those characters came to town, they always hooked up with George. And he, he taught me. He taught me literally everything uh, in reference to uh, how to produce television, how to do it. Uh, today we do it by the numbers. He kept saying, what happens if the, uh, if the display goes out? What are you going to do then? And he, So he taught us how to do it manually. And he just poured into us and taught us about uh, air presence and all the rest of that and how not to have dead air. You know, it still drives me crazy. I listen to programs and that dead air thing, just I could drive off the road behind that. But like I said, uh, our mindset, you see, I come from the Walter Cronkite era. Uh, you don't play with the news. You just give it to him. You don't add your opinion. You just give it to him. And I always loved the way he closed his his. Uh, his news broadcast, and he would say, and that's the way it was. And there was so much honor in that. And then we look at today's media, and it's so opinionated. Uh, you know, they just, ugh, I can't stand it. So you have to really be in tune with what you believe in, and then you have to open your ears to hear it, and then you have to look beyond the visual presentation because they'll show you anything with commentary under the bottom of it, and you think that's the truth. So... If I also along the way, I've learned to seek the truth, find the ones that are doing it the right way so that when you come up, if they reference to you, they know that you're coming with a content of character. And I hope that that's something that I put out there over the years, too. Yeah. Um, my first break in radio came riding down the street on the bus. And uh, I'll never forget the radio teacher told us that there were good radio stations and then there were toilet stations. And uh, uh, 62 KG, KGW was big. And uh, one of the teachers there, we, he was teaching us to write script and stuff in class. He said, he, he looked at some stuff we had written and he told us that, he said, you could write for the network. And I started laughing. But I was on the bus on Belmont. I looked over and Michael Vance, who was on our first radio station here, true black radio station here, which was KQIV back in the day. Um, and also let me kind of, Go back before that to Why Soul, which was a which was a station that was on Seventh uh, Street, uh, just off of Knott Street, right next to the community store right there. Uh, Ken Berry, Donnie Adair, Kevin Berry. Uh, he was a youngster. A lot of people don't know it, but Kevin started before me. But the, the thing about uh, Why Soul, Why Soul, they had these little transmitters, and you would put one in your house, and another person would put one in their house. I could only pick Why Soul up in the driveway of my house. I lived on 12th Street and Why Soul was on 7th Street. So that should tell you about the signal. I couldn't pick it up in the house, but I could pick it up in the driveway. But they had a host of individuals that were down there. As I said, Kevin Berry, Ken Berry, uh, Michael Vance, um, uh, Brother O'Farrell, um, a few other voices that that were there. And then when that, that part of it shut down, Roy J. acquired KQIV. And, uh, and I bring that up only because he brought us uh, National Black Network News, something that I had never heard of. And they had stories about this story in particular, about how the Jacksons, in particular Tito Jackson and Jermaine, they got busted in the early Jackson days for buying stolen televisions. And the only way we'd have known that would have been because of National Black Network News. And it sounds small, but that was big then. And, of course, it's gone on to do greater things under different names. But that was our first exposure to, to international and national news that was relevant to me as a person of color. And so in listening to that, I gained a little strength to move forward and note that if I did anything, it had to have information, uh, community news, a community calendar. And so we began to uh, uh, try some of those things, like I said, in class. Uh, 
picked up a couple of records because we had to learn how to use the board. I'll never forget that. And we did the first time. Next time I went over there and I think Pleasure was in there, something from Pleasure in the early days. And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, oh, 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 oh. Um, Archie Bell and the Drills, Tighten Up was in there. So I grabbed these two records and the radio station at college, uh, which was PCC, was KPCC, the 1250, the nifty 650 on your AM dial. And that's where it began. We did it. And there was a guy in class. His name was Dick Beckman. It's funny that and I was thinking about Dick today because I work at the college still. And uh, I was wondering how he was doing. So I'm going to try to dig him up after t- tonight and find him. But we were doing it sitting there and he looked at me and he said, he said, you got to have an air name. And I didn't understand that. And he said, well, use your initials. And J.W. Friday just did not ring right. I had another friend. He went to Jeff, too. I, I, and and Jan, uh, Grand Generals, if there are any of you out there wondering why I keep talking about demos, it's because, you know, demo rats need some recognition. But anyway, <laughs> uh, his name was. They called him D.C. His name was Daryl Cox. They called him D.C. I thought that was so cool. So, but my initials weren't that. So Dick Beckman looked at me and said, J.W. Friday, your main man with the master plan. That's exactly what he said. And I bought it. I used it for a few minutes. The class laughed. And I think the more they laughed, the more I liked it. And then as the years went on, lo and behold, I'm still J.W. You know, not just J.W., but J the dash to D.U.B. And so we did that and moved forward, as I say, riding on the bus, passing KBU, which was classified as a toilet station. I saw Michael Vance going in. I got off the bus, knocked on the door. He let me in. And a young lady that was on KQIV, her name was Tony. And I, I'm sorry that I can't remember her last name, but we used to call her Sister Tony. And uh, she was some of the remnant from KQIV. And she was working with Michael. And uh, we went in and I listened to it. And he allowed me to introduce one song. And I'll never forget hearing my voice on the FM station. It sounded, as I was talking about earlier, sounded so resonant. I was like, wow. And then somebody called (laughs) and said these words. He sounds so sexy. And I was hooked. (laughs) I was hooked in radio and was headed for uh, television. And then um, sitting here thinking about that, the year that uh, Mount St. Helens erupted uh michael it was a thanksgiving weekend and michael was headed to seattle and the volcano erupted and there was no news out of seattle so i thought michael was stranded (laughs) up there and in a nutshell he got a job on the radio station in seattle so he never came back and so i started uh sitting in on kabu and uh i think we had I think we were one hour. No, no, we were two. And it was not, was it on a Saturday? Yes. It was two hours on a Saturday. And so I hung out. Uh, Lady Tony, uh, she hung with us for a while, but then she, she went her way, and then it was just on me. And I'll never forget in talking with uh, um, the program director when they said, well, you can carry the show on. And Jane Bloom looked at me. She was the... Uh, our uh, community relations person, and she looked at me and said, go for it. And we went for it and started finding out what the information was. Because music is easy, but uh, we needed more. And we started doing a uh, community calendar. Cable did one, but we did one for our, our uh, community specifically. So um, within that, and also a uh, shout out to Lanita Duke and Grassroot News Northwest because that's where uh, she got her start. And she got her start on the day that I decided to take a Saturday off. <laughs> and it probably was the biggest mistake I had ever made in my life because I turned my show over to a gentleman by the name of Lynn Franklin. And Lynn Franklin worked at the House of Sound Records. And he provided us all of our music. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. God rest you, both of you guys. Uh, that's where we got our music at. And they would loan me the records on a Saturday and I would bring them back on a Sunday. And then one day I, I told Willie, I wasn't going to bring back not near another record. And he said, why not? I said, cause Willie, every time I play one song and come down here and work for you free on Saturday, I sell 25. 
And he said, I think you need to keep those records. So that's how we began to uh, build our music up. And so we thank the House of Sound, Lynn Franklin, and for Lynn Franklin sitting in and bringing Lanita Duke to the attention of our community. And uh, that's how it started. Uh, names that are very familiar to all of us. And, uh, you know, my mom always told me when you go in the door by yourself, put your foot in the door. My daddy always said, put your foot in the door because there's somebody coming behind you. So uh, we live, we learn. It originally was Black Rock 88 Electric Glide. And that comes from George Page. He said, what you doing, man? You driving the Buick now? That's the name of my, my radio program on KBU. Uh, the original name uh, was The Essence of Soul. Um, and we ran with that for a long time. And, uh, then I changed it to Afro American jam stand. And that's when we would get up in the morning and, and watch American bandstand on a Saturday. And, uh, uh, soul train was coming in with a real weak feed. It was fading in and out, but it was on on a Saturday and we could pick it up just enough to see what the top 10 would be. If not, we get hold of a jet magazine you know, or of course, Billboard. Uh, but yeah, it started as es the essence of soul, then it shifted to Afro-American jam standing. And when I didn't go back to the essence of soul, uh, Shahid Hamid, who had been working at uh, KBU doing news and stuff, and he wanted, he began to do a show, and he asked me if he could carry on the name essence of soul. And you got to understand what that meant. It's like a fine perfume. Ladies know that, that you can have a perfume. They had those little small bottles and they had a little dab and they, they put a little dip behind their ear. And it's such a, a, a pungent smell, a sweet savor, you know, and it's like, oh, you must have on that number 18, that number 19. So that's what that essence was, because it was just a splash of the good stuff. And I'll never forget Shahid wanted to change the name to the original essence of soul. I said, at that point, you have to leave the show. And he's like, why? I said, because I'm not doing it. I'm the original, but Shahid carried that on till his death, uh, which was just about uh, two years ago. And uh, we're thankful that he carried the name on because he did a great job bringing jazz fusion in and some of the other things, as well as representing for the uh, Nation of Islam and the Islam families throughout our city. So it was it was a good collaboration. And as I said, we went to Afro-American Jam Stand and then Black Rock 88, which the 88 keys on the piano, that's where the 88 comes from. And Black Rock uh, ties into Rilla Rock. If there's an old cartoon, uh, one of them old ones, and, the, and the, sun, the song is Sunset Ralston. Sunset Ralston on the Rilla Rock, and so and so and so forth. Sunset Ralston on the Rilla Rock, and so and so forth. So Rilla Rock, it speaks for it. Right now, you know, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's still working. So Black Rock 88 was the radio program. And then we got this bright idea that we needed to do a dance program on television. And it turned into just that. We took it down to um, then Rogers Cable, uh, working with another radio personality that I want to reference to is Art Alexander, because Art worked on uh, KOAP, which is Channel 10, our public uh, broadcast uh, uh, station. Uh, he had a jazz fusion show. I was on KBU, and uh, also at that time I was also on Kissin Radio, which turned in started as KISN but became KKSL. And I couldn't do KBU and Kissin at the same time, so that's when the name Dupree Casey became prominent in our community. A young man out of Benson High School. He was working their radio station, and he was sitting in for me on on KBU at 90.7. Uh, Art Alexander was on KOAP at, at 91.1, and I was on 91 AM. So for the first time in the history of the city, we had three choices. And we haven't had three choices of music since then. And it, would always, and it always blew Art's mind because I would tell him he was on. And he would say, why are you advertising me? I said, because we need choices. You know, I've never wanted to be that one that one way we need choices, you know, so we open the door up and the rest is is easy. And working with uh, the late uh, Savidia Symington, who ran Matt Dishman Community Center, we ran a series of dances for the kids during the summer. We had the best poppers, the best uh, breakers 
Everybody was down there. Also, I had the best uh, community DJs in the world. Electro Wiz, Greg Washington, uh, 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 Megatron. Uh, we had the best. Doc Rock, Kelvin Wood, still doing things. You can catch him up at Alan A. I mean, they came up and, and they brought all the music and all the popularity. And we were in Matt Dishman Pack Beyond Fire Code. All the kids were down there. And thus we took them to the studio and the rest is history. There's only about three episodes of Black Rock 88, yeah, but it happened. And now people are still waiting because they want to be on it. And the adults want us to do another one for the adults first and then the kids. And I think it's going to happen this summer. So, yeah, that's Black Rock 88. Still alive and well. Uh, I like this term. Music sues the savage beast. And there's something uh, I, I, I think about. I reference to art. Art played Kungus, so he was, you know, he was in the rhythms and things. And the unique thing about it, he would, he would bring his drum up in Irvington Park. And like I said, I lived on 12, and I could hear this drum. And that drum beat drew me from my house on 12 to the top of the hill in Irvington Park. Um, music is important, but to communicate is even better. And we had so many issues going on uh, during that time, different protests and reasons for those protests, the same things that are going on now. And, and we needed to be able to not just uh, protest, but to be able to talk about why we are protesting. And not only that, to be that beacon to tell the people what we're about to do, where we're going to meet at and, and how we need to meet. And I, I think back to Ron Herndon and the Black United Front. Uh, they were dealing with the Portland Public Schools and they were about to pull a boycott. It was the weekend. They didn't know what was going on. And next thing I heard the buzzer buzz and it was Ron and his cadre of people. And I'm like, hey, man, come on in. And we sat down there that night, had that four hour show and they sat with us. And the whole city was in tune to see if we were going to boycott Portland public schools or not. So I understand that media is power. I've always known that being around George Page and and those before him, they told us how important it was that we had this informational source and it doesn't always have to come because people get paid for it. Sometimes greater things come when you don't get paid, when your heart is in it. You know, it's just like cable access, which is access to the television channels that we didn't have still available. And we can have shows that are just as tight as ABC, NBC and CBS if we just take the time to do that. So, I'm, I, like I said, again, I've always just wanted to be a part of that 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 movement. You know, that was lifting us up as a people, uh, as I said, trained up. My dad was a union man, so he taught us about what a union is and wh why that's important. My mom was NAACP, Urban League, all of those things. She's a missionary. You know, she understood it. We hosted the pastors at our house all the time for dinner. And let me tell you something. We call the police on our kids today. But my greatest fear is mom told pastor. Because that embarrassed her. And pastors come into our house to talk to me about my behavior. And we're going to sit down. We're going to discuss it. But I was, I was happy pastor was there. My greatest fear was when pastor left. Because I embarrassed my mother that she had to call the pastor. So I had a price to pay. And if you understand what that term price to pay is, you wouldn't do the things that you do that send us into incarceration and all those other kind of things. So I'm thankful for parents that trained us up in the way we should go. As scripture says, that when we are old, we will not depart. So those whippings were worth it. And I didn't call 911 on my mom. Had I, my hand would be like this today. <laughs> so, yeah. George Page, the master blaster. And I'm telling you, he, he came on before me. He started his program on Saturday. He started about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And he would go 2 to 4. And 4 to 6 would be the blues. Uh, oh, man, Tom. I'm missing Tom's last name. Forgive me, Tom. But Tom held down the blues show. And every now and then, George would carry it all the way through from 2 to 8 o'clock. And one day, he got on me and said, man, why don't you play some blues? And, of course, me, I'm from Parliament Funkadelic. You know what I'm saying? Uh, knee deep. And, and she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes and things like that. That's where I was at. And I looked him dead in the face and said, man, because there ain't no funk in the blues. And he said, all right, all right. We're going we gonna to see about that. And as I said, uh the Muddy Waters and all the big blue stars when they came to town, they were his friends. So maybe a week passed and he said to me, he said, look, man, here. I said, what? And so he handed me two tickets to the B.B. King concert. And I was like, oh, man, this is great. So we're at the Paramount 
and, and I'm sitting in the front row. This is real talk. I'm in the front row. And the BB's on stage. And, I mean, they are kicking. I mean, I'm enjoying myself. And George is stage left. I can see him, you know. And he's there. He sees me. And then BB, right in the midst of it, man, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And they broke it down. Kick it to move. And uh, he said, Lucille. And he grabs him. He said, there's, there's this young man. He's here. I, I don't know if he's in the front row. He might, he might be outside. I don't know. But, but this young man thinks there's no fault in the blues. And then he had Lucille make some noise like, whoop, whoop, like what? And he said, Lucille? And then Lucille said, yeah, yeah. He said, can we show this young man that there's funk in the blues? And Lucille went, doo doop 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 like this. And he went, one, two, three, four. And man, let me tell you, there's a song called Mothership Connection. And it's George Duke and Stanley Clark. And that drum introduction is something so funky it makes no kind of sense. And that's the drum intro. And then all of a sudden, man, they went somewhere that I had never been in the funk. And he swung it to the left and he swung it to the right. He picked it up and then he slammed it on the floor. And then he stopped and he said, now is there funk in the blues? And the whole house just exploded. And George Page was staged left doing like this. I told you, I told you. Well, come that Saturday, all I played was the blues. So I got spanked to the blues by the best, and that was B.B. King. And George set it up, but it's something I will never forget. Still got the stubs from that night, because most people want to say, you're lying. No, I'm telling you the truth. I learned that there's funk in the blues, and from that research, I realized how funky the blues really is, because you get older, one of them real bluesy love songs, when your heart is broke, oh, there's some funk in that. When they talk about there's funk in the game, it's funk in the blues. So, yeah, that's my favorite funk story. <laughs> yeah. Imperial Skating Rink. Um, straight down Martin Luther King, just before you get to the bridge. Um, roller skating. Uh, something special, man. It, and, of course, you bring out some great music and roller skates. Got to go together. There's something about it. Uh, I was hanging with my, my security guards were the Rhino Brothers. If anybody, a lot of people know who they are. The Wright brothers, Myron and Dirk Wright, they were twins. And uh, I love them brothers. Met them at Adams High School when I was working there as a uh, attendance counselor. And, and we clicked like new money. And so they could skate. I mean, they were big boys. They couldn't just skate. They could crazy leg. If you know anything about skating, that's when, you know, it looks like the shoe's untied, but it's not. And they were flipping and flopping and doing all this stuff. But, man, the skating rink was the joint. It was the spot. Everybody could skate. I think about uh, I think about Michael Ferguson, Fergberg. He could skate. I think about Arthur Lee, the late Arthur Lee. He could skate. He had this this style of kicking his leg out. Then I think about the 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 first team rollers in our city called the Tootsie Rollers, and they would just be swinging around the edges, just dancing. And me myself, I had a I had I, I was pretty cool. I had, they did, what they didn't know about me was everybody else had the regular wheels. I had a big old pair of these orange kryptonite wheels and they rolled a little slower than everybody else. So I was a bit more in control than out of control. So so I was hanging with the Rhino brothers. And then, uh, like I said, there was another brother that skated during that era. His name was Ronnie Johnson and Ronnie Johnson was blind. He literally he was diagnosed as being blind. And the funny part about Ronnie, he'd be skating with this with his stick. And then one day somebody got this bright idea. It was supposed to have been a, uh, a fundraiser for KBU that we would skate from Irvington Park to Laurelhurst. And, man, we must have had 100 people out on roller skates. And who was leading the charge? Ronnie Johnson. Ronnie was just gone. And the thing about Ronnie was so crazy. They would tell him, he said, every time the doctor tells me that I can't skate, J-Dub, I skate even faster. And if you saw him to this day, he makes his way like, you know, he's good to go. And. And he was an inspiration to us. But the, the, the skating rink was a place, man, where everybody showed up. Parents knew where their kids were. I think the best part was at the end because we had all the parents out there, you know, coming to pick their kids up. And I had a uh, brown Buick Estate station wagon. And uh, one of the Rhino brothers named the car the Doo-Doo Wagon because it was dark brown. And the Doo-Doo Wagon would load up with all the kids going up MLK. And I'd drive up MLK and drop them off on every corner. Some I took them to their house. But I had the car so loaded one night with the Rhino brothers. The car was leaning back like this. 
And I hollered in the back and say, hey, Dirk, move to the front because you got the car doing a wheelie. And everybody's still talking about that. So, yeah, that was the Imperial Skating Rink. And uh, you can thank uh, Aaron and Craig. And that's all I need to say. That's who promoted that event. And we were in there every week having a ball. Not a whole lot of fights and all that old stupid stuff. We just come in and have a great time. Because that's another thing about me. I set a code at Matt Dishman. Matt Dishman. See, this right here for the rappers, they knew what that meant. That meant cut it off. And if you didn't cut it off, I didn't plug the whole system. There was a young lady rapping at one of our contests one time, and she was flowing. She was in the midst of it. She was one of the best at that given time. But she could have only two songs. She was going to the third one. I did like this. She said, oh, J-Dub, I'm not done. And I hollered, oh, but you are. And, and everybody's still talking about that. Some walk by, they go, oh, but you are. I say, you still remember. But they know the code. And that's the thing. Um, when I grew up, players and hustlers had a code. There was a player's code. And I'm not trying to turn it into a player movie, but there was a code. They didn't do certain things with kids. They, they, they represented what they were, and they didn't cross the lines. So there was a code to this thing. So we just established this code that these are the rules, and if you're going to be a part of this, this is how it is. And if you have any questions, don't go ask anybody else. Ask me, because I'm the one that will start you, and I'm the one that will cut you off. So it was important. And they took all those rules from Matt Dishman, took them to the skating rink, and the Imperial was a great thing. Now it's a soccer rink, and we really we still have Oaks Park, which they have a evening skate for adults, but they really we don't really get together like that anymore. Wow, great year, 1970. That's the year I graduated. I like to say that it was the last year of the Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud Corps because we lived by that. We were black, we were proud, and it meant something. Remember the Olympics? Hey, hey, all of that, that meant something. And that was the year that the, the Trailblazers walked well, the 70s was, was 1976, if I'm not mistaken, was the year that they walked the dog and brought that championship home. We had some dynamic players, and they were so personable. I mean, Maurice Lucas, come on, man, Lionel Hollins. I mean, of course, Bill Walton. You can see Bill Walton in Southeast Portland playing ball and kicking it with everybody. Herm Gilliam, the trickster, that was my partner. You know, and the thing I like, I, I, I bounce back to Maurice Lucas, because Maurice Lucas had – he was funny. He thought he was a comedian. And once he realized that my name was Friday, he called me everything but my last name. And I'll never forget, I met his, his wife, and she asked me what my real name was. And from that moment on, she started calling me Jimmy. And, I had, and he would, every time he saw me, he would say something crazy. And I, I remember one day I was walking down, come down the street we at, over near uh, the King Neighborhood Facility. He saw me. He said, man, where are you going? I said, I'm going over to, lunch, to Jeff and have lunch. He said, I'm riding with you. He left his car right there, jumped in my car. And you can imagine what happened when we hit the hall with Maurice Lucas. Man, and everybody was like, well, who he with? I'm like, he with me, man, he with me. And, of course, he got all the basketball players over there in the corner giving them encouragement. I, I love me some Maurice Lucas. Once again, for you young Blazers, should you catch this or anybody out there, man, be personable, be accessible, man. Remember, you're, you're not a superstar. You're a regular person in a phenomenal position and be phenomenal because the young people are looking up to you. Never brush them off. Encourage them and let them know it's not all about basketball. Let them know that they have a mind and they need to develop it in the right way. So Maurice was always encouraging me. Michael Thompson was my guy. He used to throw me the keys to his Mercedes Benz. And being a Golden State Warrior fan, you know that I'm loving his son, Clay and what he's doing. And I believe we're going to win another championship here in a, in a very short time. But the 70s was a great time because we had so many great venues of music. I can talk about the Cotton Club, uh, the Table Square. There were some places to go. But the best holes were the holes, the bars, those places that folk would think nobody was jamming. I mean, we had lose higher ground and, and, and them spots. You know what I'm saying? The Texas was kicking. And, man, there was just so much music. And, and I'm here to tell you, Euro Thomas was tearing things up. Mr. Hey, out there, don't be no square. Now you know him as Euro Thomas and the pain. And he's still bringing it, man. It's some, he's quite a character, ever teaching, ever molding, ever shaping. You know, and, like, we already know how can we talk about the 70s and, and, and not talk about Geneva's, where friends meet. <laughs> as a matter of fact, the best part of that, this is really kind of neat. I love this because when the Blazers won the championship, I was at my buddy's house not far from where we're producing this, right behind the uh, Music Millennium. And as soon as we won, I said, man, I'm out of here. They said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Geneva's. 
And we ran down, drove down to Geneva's and everybody and their mama was in front of Geneva's. And we were partying, partying, partying. And uh, I was riding on top of somebody's car. But long story short, there's a 30, uh, 30 for 30 uh, episode uh, where they focus on Bill Walton and they come to Portland and they look at that. And it came on a few months back and everybody had a they, matter of fact, they had a special showing. I missed the showing. And then when it came on television, my phone started ringing. Say, man, I just saw you at the Blazer Championship. I said, where'd you see me, man? On 30 for 30. I said, I'm, I'm there because I knew I was there. You know, I was riding on top of somebody's car and I saw myself on on CBS News that night when they came to Portland. And one thing also about that championship, they did not present the trophy to the Trailblazers because they didn't think the Blazers were going to win it. And they immediately cut the golf. So we never saw the Blazers receive the championship trophy just for the record. And then Lionel Hollins uh, married a dear friend of mine's sister. And she saw him on television and told me, I'm going to marry him. I didn't believe her. Then we came to the house for a a private house party. And who opened the door and welcomed me in? It was Lionel Hollins. And I tried my best not to bring up basketball. I talked about everything else. And he said, don't you want to talk basketball? I said, thank you for opening the door. And once again, coming back to how personable uh, the former Blazers were. Uh, And uh, also Deshaun's. He was my one of my uh, radio teachers. And, uh, man, he was just as nice uh, 30 years ago as he was previous to his passing. Great guy. Oh, my goodness. Bill Shonley. And he told me I could write for the network, too. So, yeah. And, it, oh, the other guy that told me, his name was Eric Norberg, and he was part of the morning crew on, on KGW. And his favorite line was, let's have another cup of coffee. <laughs> I've always known that I had a calling on my life. I just didn't know what a calling was. But um, I've always known that. Uh, And I say that because I was just bad enough, but not too bad. It seemed like he was always just stopping me before I ended up at JDH, (laughs) just stopping me before I ended up in the backseat of a police car. I always wouldn't go that far and get close and some would say you're a chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a chicken to some degree. But I just never crossed over to that thing that would have my mother kill me on the spot. And so I stayed away from different things. But uh, for me, when he made it, when he secured that it was true, I was working for uh, KKSL Kissing Radio. And uh, they were out on Sandy Boulevard at about, oh, 230th, you can see the towers that are out there. That's where we were operating. And I had did a long shift and got off late that night. And the guy gave me a ride back in as close as he could. And they dropped me off in the Hollywood district, about 62nd. And I was going to walk down the 12th. No big deal. Clear night. I'll never forget it. I can see it right now. I can see the moon. And as I'm walking, as I'm walking, Spirit spoke to me. Lord spoke to me. And this is real, like I said, very audible. I want you to preach my gospel. I heard him clear as I'm talking right now. And I was like, yeah, right. So when I got home, because it was a long walk. And when I got home, I'll never forget. My mom sat at her chair in the corner with her Bible and all of that. And I went over and I I grabbed her Bible. I passed by uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy and all the rest of that because I couldn't pronounce most of it. And I found myself thumbing through the Psalms. And I took it for a moment and I threw it back. Nah, you don't want me. And then he was chipping at me then. And uh, you can really, the transition came and you can thank uh, Lionel Richie when he put the album out with Brick House on it. Remember that one? Everybody remembers that. And Brick House and Zoom was on the same thing. And I was like, man, kick it. Brick House. And one thing about Brick House, that introduction is where my little little, uh, rant of TGIF, TGIF, J Friday plays the best. That was on the intro to Brick House. And I loved it. So we always played it. But there was another song on the album that should not have been on that album. And that song was Jesus is Love. And I mean, and he sang it the way it was supposed to be played. And he, he put his foot in it. And that's I just kept humming that song. Jesus is love. And I was like, whoa, what a song. 
So it found its way into my playlist and it was the last song that I would play going off the air just before Rick Mitchell came on at midnight. And I was playing the song and I don't know what I was doing prior to it. And then I realized that I wanted to play Freak of the Week. Follow me, Funk of that one more time, Funk of that one more time. And I'm like, I can't play Freak of the Week and go into Jesus's love. This is not going to work. You know, but I always, what I like to do, I like to mess Rick Mitchell up. He was a guy that came on behind me. I like to get him a song, something he, he know he can't transition out of. It was pr- just how I thought of how I played the game then. I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave you hanging, man. I'm going to leave you hanging. But then the Lord left me hanging one night. It's like, you know you can't play Freak the Week. And it was time. It was, the time had passed. It was past 8. It's like 10. I'm thinking about this all night. It's 11 o'clock. And it's like, what am I going to do, man? I can't do this going in there. So I changed the whole format of the program. And at about 20 minutes to midnight, I slowed it down. And I went into something that was very smooth, instrumental, not really saying a whole lot, but it transitioned beautifully into Jesus's love. And then Rick Mitchell was like, I don't know what to play now. I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep playing Jesus's love if you don't know what to play after this perfect closer. So then all of a sudden, all I was thinking about, this is real. I started at eight, but all I was thinking about was 1140 because that's when we would start transitioning for Jesus's love. So all of a sudden. From one song, it became a hard 15 minutes of gospel, hard gospel, the good stuff, the blessed assurance, the amazing grace. What a mighty God we serve. And it's like, man, that just closed it out perfectly. And to those that were picking up on it, it's like, hey, man, you're getting caught up. You're getting caught up. You're getting caught up. And then I realized that you can't have gospel music without a gospel word. But he hadn't told me it was time for me to do it. So I called uh, the late uh, Robert Earl Houston. And he, it was funny, he said, I'm in my pajamas, but I'll be right down. Matter of fact, I take that back. I called Dr. Pack, Pastor Pack first, but it was too late for him. He was getting ready. And I called a younger preacher and he jumped up and came down in his pajamas with a trench coat on. I never forget, it was so funny. He came in and he brought a word. And I was loving it because now it's, a, it's 1130. I got a preacher. I got this gospel music going forth. I'm, I'm good to go. That last half hour became my whole reason for even being on the air. I didn't care about none of it. And then one Saturday night right after that, it was Christmas Eve. And I I played a secular song, first song. Then I was like, it's Christmas Eve. This don't make no sense. So I started just playing gospel at 8 o'clock, 8.10. And I played gospel all night long. And the feedback from my community was just this. J-Dub, that was perfect. We were rapping presents and having fun, man. And, and then I brought a word that night. Lord, put something on my heart because Robert couldn't get there. And he put it on my heart. I'd been talking to my pastor about my calling and, and about, he said, man, you got to be sure of your calling. You know, you got to you got to make certain that God has called you. Some people come because somebody tells them they're a preacher. Some go because they want to be a preacher. But if God hasn't called you to be a preacher, that's kind of a wasted thing. And uh, so it was my first sermon was coming up and somewhere in the midst of that Christmas night, I gave my first sermon maybe two weeks in advance. And I'll never forget it because my dear friend Nancy Smith said, you're supposed to preach in two weeks, not tonight. And from that moment on, I never looked back. And then all I was living for on the radio was that last half an hour. Then it turned into the last hour. And I'll never forget it because I'd been playing gospel for about three years. And all of a sudden, somebody said I was proselytizing. And I was like, I was what? (laughs) And the funny part about it, uh, when they accused me of it, they spelled it wrong. And that was my running gag. If you want to accuse me of something, at least spell it right. And the rest is kind of history. I I followed that spirit, and and we uh, we lost George Page. He passed away. And it's really funny because George was a big burly character, man. If you'd have told me that, that somebody shot him and they shot him nine times and the last time was with a bazooka and he lived, I would have believed it. But we were out, he was out on a industrial shoot and got bit by a spider. And it took him out. Sounds crazy, but that's what happened. And then right after that, we lost Dupree Casey, a young man. And... I was on this thing about death and old school. Death comes in threes. 
and I knew the next person was going to be me. Little did I know that another person that was on cable had already passed before George. So the three had already been accomplished. So uh, George had passed, Dupree had passed, and then the radio station suddenly was giving them all this glory about how great they were. But they weren't doing that while they were alive. And I didn't want to die and have all this false glory coming from people that really didn't care about me but were happy that I was raising money for them. So it was time for me to, uh, to leave radio. And I left. I had that, that great night, and uh, I'll never forget they wrote it up, no more Friday on Saturday. <laughs> so I answered the call of God, and I think I was gone for a decade as God prepared me, and then he gave me permission to come back. Not to Cambu, but to come back and start doing other things within the community. And... Um, that was about um, when uh, Kevin Berry, Kevin had reestablished himself uh, doing different things in our community. And he and his brother, Ken, who's also my hero and mentor, uh, they were doing the, the very, very old school events. And they threw an old school event and they asked me if I would come down. And uh, I did because I literally wasn't going to the clubs. I wasn't doing dance. I wasn't doing nothing. And it was crazy because I was afraid. I was afraid. I'll never forget it. And this is the other part of it. Uh, how I got in the groove was behind the song Mothership Connection, Stanley Clark and all that. And I had was downtown. I got a room downtown. I walked across the bridge and they were across the street from the convention center. And I was coming in from the backside. So I threw that jam in and got locked in. Literally, I was walking to the beat, man. And with every step, I gained more and more courage. And I'll never forget coming in the door. Kevin was spinning, and he said, hey, everybody, guess who's here? You remember J.W. Friday? And the house just exploded. And I was like, man, Lord, this is great. You know, but he had a handle on me. He would only let me go so far. So I had that opportunity and then kind of disappeared again for a while until he finished the work that he, he had for me. And then he sent me back into the community to do what we're doing. And uh, little did I realize uh, because of the pastors I was running with, and they were doing a lot of homegoing celebrations, that these entrustments would be entrusted to me like they are today. But the best part of all of that is because they met me during the Black Rock 88 days, they met me during the Cavaliers Unlimited days, they met me during the Drum Major days, uh, we all knew each other. And so when I come into a family house, they bust out laughing, hey, guess who's here is J-Dub, and I am not a comedian. And I do not know why they laugh when I come in the room. But all I know is when I come in the room, the laughter comes in and the sadness leaves. So if that's what you want to do with me, Lord, so be it. And then he called into order Bright Star Ministries. And that's his calling. He gave me the scripture first, which is Daniel 12 and 3. And that says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And I kept rehearsing that in my spirit. I said, Lord, what is that all about? And he said, that's about bright star. And I had grown up in at Morning Star under the late Dr. T.L. Lewis, one of the greatest storytellers that the city has ever had. He had his master in theology. He was deep in Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and all of that. But he also had, when he tell his stories, he had the greatest laugh. He would go, ha ha, in the midst of it. Quite a guy. And uh, in talking with him, like he said, in answering my calling, it was no new news to nobody but me. So Bright Star was born, and now it's Bright Star Ministries Empowerment Temple. And the whole thing is, it's all right here. We've been in buildings, but buildings can't confine what God has. And it's not about a building fight, but it's about a soul fight. And if I can uh, say a word of encouragement to you, that's what I do. And that's kind of my, uh, I think the ladies would call it chakra, <laughs> you know, positivity. Uh, another thing I used to say is keeping it positive and kicking it down the line. And so uh, God rest B.D. Symington because he's another that was a part of that during that time when we brought you the Groove Factor Relays. So, yeah. So we've got the Groove Factor Relays, the Groove Factor basketball team, the Groove Factor dance team. These are other 
things that we've had in, in the community over the years. So we've had a lot of fun, you know, and hopefully we can have even more fun this summer. So uh, keep your ears open for the summer of 20 and 24 because the return of Black Rock 88 for the old school as well as for their children. And you don't think them grandma's going to turn the TV on to see their babies dance? You better believe it. But the academics got to be right. And they got to follow the rules. And they got to understand the cutoff because <laughs> it's still in full effect. So, yeah. So God called. I'm called by God. I'm licensed by God. I'm ordained across denominations. So I'm not just Baptist. Uh, I'm Church of God in Christ. I'm full gospel Pentecostal. I'm Church of the Living God, Church of God, Genesis to Revelation. That's me. And I'm thankful to have those kind of fellowships. So God is an unlimited God, and and I'm going to try to be unlimited as well. Oh, that's right. I'm a Cavalier Unlimited. <laughs> so it started early. So, yeah. In the troubled times, because we all have them, there's a point when mom and daddy can't help you, and you're really dealing with your own personal struggle. Uh, the 71st number of Psalms said it for me when I couldn't find didn't have a pot or a window, couldn't find a friend, and everybody knew my name. And that's, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. And that kind of ties into my closing statement, which is life is what you make it, only you fake it. And then, as I just told you a moment ago, it turned into Daniel 12 and 3. And when you really compare life is what you make it, only you fake it to, and they that be wise, to shine as the brightness of the firmament. They turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That is, life is what you make it, and only you fake it. So that's where I'm at. And the funny part about that is, in this journey, there was moments when I was faking it. And it wasn't when Jesse was saying, fake it till you make it. I was faking it, and I could feel it. And until I changed my lifestyle, I changed my thought pattern, I was faking it. You know, and that's for anybody. Uh, you can change your thought pattern, change your lifestyle, and, and things will improve, especially when you get out of your egos, you know, and just do it the right way. So, yeah. And the other thing, I can make it. That's Mom always told me, you can make it. And uh, that's how I feel. I'm looking forward to what lies ahead. Sure, there'll be some complications somewhere, but guess what? We can make it. We can make it. <laughs> I, 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 I preach this. I preach this at home going services all the time. Um, there's a song that they always play when it's time to view the body. And it's going up yonder. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll, I'll fly away. Uh, but you're not going to do that in my service. It ain't going to be like that. Uh, my exit song is going to be more bounce to the ounce. The heavy D remix, which is a little more, a little more footwork oriented. And, uh, when you hear that song, I want you to throw your head back. Holler the J-Dub was a fool. And then dance out and go on about your business. Because you won't be following me to no, to no hole because I'm a cremation. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And I want to be shook out on the track in the curve to the home stretch. And some people ask what that's all about. I, because for the distance runner, and I was a distance runner, I ran the 880. And I placed fourth one time. That was my fault. And I'll be very honest about it. I placed fourth because I smoked some weed with Mike Swing. I'm not even sure that I inhaled, but we went out there and we puffed on it. There was a track meet that night, and uh, the coach said, they're going to try to box you in, Friday. Don't let them box you in. I didn't care because I had one hell of a kick. They boxed me in. I had to drop all the way back to the end. And I came around the corner, but I was two steps too few. And I tell kids all the time, you know, drugs and sports, they don't mix and it'll cost you. So uh, I want to be remembered as somebody that was uh, accessible because I never high side. And I learned that from Maurice Lucas and the gang. You know, no matter what you're doing, man, don't be so big that you're unreachable. Be available, be funny, you know, but be serious. Let them know who you are. And in that, they'll give you all the respect in the world because there's no price on respect. You earn it. So uh, remember, I messed up smoking that weed and I placed fourth. I would be able to sit here and tell you I never placed lower than third. 
So I always heard my name on the announcement thing. But check this out. Lincoln High School on that day, they said in fourth place, they said my name and they never do that. So that's why I tell that story to kids. because I don't want them to have their name announced when you don't want to hear it. That's J-Dub. You know, mom made me personable. And I like people. I do better with people than I do by myself. So, yeah, here I am. Thanks for tuning in to Oregon Hidden Legacy. For more information about this podcast, go to OregonHiddenLegacy.org.